absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Again, my name is Tom Edwards, and I'm going to be talking about the evolution of experience. So, what do you start in your day with? What captures your memories, connects you with your loved ones, gets you from point A to point B, unlocks endless entertainment options for you? If you haven't guessed it already, it's your mobile device. If it's not already in your hands, go ahead and pull it out. Look at it for a minute. Think about your relationship with it. And think about the fact that you're holding more computing power in your hand than any generation before us. And that's just the beginning. So today, we're going to look at my proprietary research. We're going to wipe the slate clean. And we're going to take a trip in the very near future to when the mobile device is no longer going to be the primary way in which you interface with technology. But before we jump to the future, I like to talk about the past a little bit. So, growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, I loved Star Wars, and still do to this day. But instead of wanting to be Han Solo or Luke Skywalker, I was just fascinated with how C-3PO and R2-D2 worked, and how the technology within the Star Wars universe seemed to just enable and empower the characters every step of the way. But growing up in the 80s, we definitely weren't quite to Star Wars technology just quite yet. And I loved gaming and watching you know, giant robot shows, but even then, gaming was self-contained. A giant robot shows. I was predetermined. If I missed a show, I had to wait a few months. Couldn't just binge watch the entire series. But heading into the 90s, there was hope, right? We start to see this, this connectivity that actually comes online. We see the graphical user interface coming out around. And more importantly, we begin to see the acceleration of mobile devices. So I got my first mobile phone in 1998. And then we saw from 1998 to the mid-2000s just hundreds of different form factors and different types of phones. And actually, what I brought with me today is one of my all-time favorite, right? Remember this? Yeah? Motorola Razor, right? Remember trying to text with this thing? Right? The three letters and the, the numbers there? And this is a key point to consider about innovation. When we talk about innovation and true disruption, it's about removing a barrier. So, but also by building on something familiar. So, as we move forward into 2007, the transformational innovation of the iPhone. It was a clean user experience, it was a touch interface, it was a consolidation of all these other form factors into one. But I would argue, what was even more important was the launch of the App Store. Because what that did is that allowed for this democratization of third parties to create applications that were personalized for you in your life. So when we think about that, it's amazing. And the impact was almost immediately felt. Over the course of the next five years, then one in five people had owned a smartphone. If you fast forward to today, 95% of Americans own a mobile phone. 77% of those are smart devices. So as you think about that ubiquity of mobile device now, that ubiquity equals accessibility. And with accessibility, we're empowered. We're empowered to create. We're empowered to amplify. We're empowered to influence. We create 400 million selfies every day. Yeah, 400 million. 95 million of those end up on Instagram. And we're creating about 300 hours of YouTube content every minute. It's quite a bit of content, so we're definitely empowered to create. When it comes to Amplify, our expectations when it comes to content now. You've got social channels that allow us to amplify and extend our message everywhere. And it's changed our behavior. We expect to be able to consume information in real time. So the other thing, too, is influence is changing. Influence no longer comes from Hollywood. It's coming from the YouTube streamer that your kids are watching potentially uh, gaming streamers, etc. And I see it in my own home. I have three Gen Zs, a 15, a 13, and a 10 year old. And it's amazing to watch. They're part of the first mobile first generation. They learn to swipe before they learn to speak. And when you think about behaviors of Gen Z, you've got two and a half hours a day of on-demand content being consumed, an hour and a half a day game, and about 50 minutes every single day listening to music. And you start thinking about why, why do we keep talking about Gen Z? By 2020, Gen Z is going to represent 40% of consumers in the United States. And their behaviors and expectations are going to impact the experiences that we as individuals will have and how technology evolves. There's an expectation for on-demand content. There's an expectation that the camera has become the new home screen. There's an expectation that YouTube is the remote control. And augmented reality and other filters is just a way of life. In terms of people to allow them to create. So speaking of creation, so 69% of Gen Z considers the camera as a platform to create from. And that's an important one to store away. 
66% have their own YouTube channel. And when millennials are all about co-creation of content, for Gen Z, it's all about everyone being a publisher. It's about full creation. Also now, when it comes to <laughs> augmented reality solutions, I love getting this on the screen. When we start talking about immersive experiences, 83% of Gen Z actually has used some type of augmented reality filter at some point. And this is really important to consider because these experiences are just becoming expected. Hardware manufacturers and others now are democratizing the ability to create augmented reality solutions as well. So when we start getting into all of these various expectations that are coming from how we're interacting with technology, now you begin to align all of those expectations with intelligent systems. And I used to talk about this idea of disruption being the new normal, right? We talked about disruption. But now what I see is exponential acceleration through artificial intelligence. What's going to happen is that our environments are going to begin to adapt to us versus us inputting into our environments. And when we think about why are we in this golden age of AI right now, three primary reasons. The first is data. In the last year, we created 10 trillion gigabytes of data in the last 12 months. 10 trillion. So data, though, is oil for artificial intelligence. The second reason is this ever-evolving advancement of algorithms. You may have heard of machine learning, which is human coded algorithms, or deep learning, which is artificial intelligence systems training themselves, or computer vision or image processing. But the fact that we have all of this data, plus these algorithms, plus this decreasing cost of graphical processing units, is all leading towards this golden age of AI. But what does that mean from a behavioral standpoint? So 43% of Gen Z, 53% of millennials, 42% of Gen X, all have an idea of around artificial intelligence that's tied to convenience. They want it to make their lives easier. And so what a lot of you may not realize is that you're already interacting with AI on a daily basis. So 35 million individuals over the last year basically use some type of virtual assistant once per month. So you're looking at kind of conversational experiences. And it may be in your living room or your kitchen right now, but the reality is we're all carrying virtual assistants around in our pocket. So the key thing to consider with voice, and we're moving towards a time to where artificial intelligence is going to basically redefine how we interface and interact with technology. We're going to move from desktop and mobile to voice, vision, and touch. So we're already interacting and interfacing with voice as we've seen here. The key thing to understand is that voice is going to be the first area that's going to drive mass adoption. And that's incredibly important to consider. So as we begin to move along, and we continue to have these dependencies on, uh, on virtual assistants, we're going to begin to see the rise of what's known as the proxy web. As these systems become more intelligent, and they're able to actually predict more of our needs, and better understand situations, this is a time where we as individuals are going to offload more of our day-to-day -day responsibility onto these virtual assistants. I'll give you an example. So say you want to schedule dinner. So both you and the individual you're scheduling dinner with essentially both have these proxies or agents that work on your behalf in the background. They already know and understand what restaurants you like, what your food preferences are, whether or not you have food allergies, where you've been, ultimately the reviews of the restaurant. They can help navigate traffic and line parking. So again, it's just all about providing ease and convenience for your life. And when you look across the generations and you talk about this concept, Gen Z is all about scheduling personal time. When you talk about millennials, they're all about replenishing purchases through these systems. They want their agents to have wallets and be able to just take care of certain things for their lives. And when you talk about Gen X, it's more about managing finances. So as long as these systems can enhance our lives, kind of predict certain things that we need, this is a, a very key point to consider. So that was voice. Now, as we shift from voice into vision, we're going to talk a little bit about computer vision. Computer vision is basically a form of artificial intelligence that allows for essentially high-level contextual understanding of your environment, where you can actually drive decisions. Think of it this way. It can basically make your camera intelligent. Remember how we talked about the importance of the camera as a home screen, as well as the, the, the platform to create from? What you'll begin to see happening is you'll see this alignment of voice plus vision to where you can understand context within your world all around you. 
it opens up this new possibility of how we search and how we interact. And it's also not that difficult to believe, to understand, that we can move beyond the mobile device into another form factor when we start looking at these different interfaces all along the way. And finally, there's touch. So when you think about natural and gesture-based interfaces, you think about this connection between digital and physical. It really comes down to our ability to where our environment becomes another sensor and a way in which we can put into it. So it's voice, it's vision, and it's touch. So thinking about all of those, you know, preparing for this talk, I realized I've had 18 mobile devices over the last 20 years. But one thing that's been incredibly consistent throughout that experience, and it's primarily been the operating system. So when you think about this bridge of how we're going to get from where we are today to where we're talking about with voice, vision, and touch, it starts with the operating system. And here's what happens. What we're going to see happen is we're going to see the virtual assistant become the primary way in which we interface with our technology. Remember I talked about the App Store being innovation? It hasn't been disrupted since 2008. We still have hundreds of applications on our phone, and yet, at the same time, we only maybe use five. So what's going to end up happening is this concept or idea of scenes, where the virtual assistant will be able to pull together multiple elements of applications into an experience. I'll give you an example of what's called scene design. It's something my colleague actually called. So as we're thinking about this, I have to have a different application right now to check into a flight to start my car, to listen to music, and maybe even pull. In this example of scene design, what ends up happening is the system is intelligent enough to basically predict the fact that I like to check in two hours early and essentially scream for an upgrade. It knows to turn my car on and to actually map the location of the airport. Upon return home, it automatically knows that I like to have music on in the home and potentially warm the pool so that I can enjoy a nice evening with my family. That is how we're going to take that step forward through this kind of context and understanding the environment. So here's where we get to the prediction. When are we no longer going to have to use the mobile device as the primary interface into technology? So across my research, it was, the, the dates were discussed from 2021 to 2043, form factors, feasibility, mass adoption by consumers. So prediction is that by 2028, we're going to reach a point in time or multimodal interfaces at scale, such as voice, vision, and touch, through different form factors such as glasses, contacts, earbuds, you know, really focusing in on audio, is when we're going to see the shift away from the mobile device into our environment adapting to us. And that is the evolution experience. Thank you.